Hello, today we'll continue with our series of uh, lectures on behavioral science. Uh, we have already covered some topics in uh, psychology, ethics, also epidemiology, and uh, last course we began our series of lectures on uh, mental disorders as they are categorized in the DSM-5. Uh, now we'll dedicate uh, some more lectures to this all the way to the end of the course because, uh, well, psychiatry is uh, the field of medicine or the branch of medicine that both relates to psychology. And USMLE, the USMLE pays a lot of attention to uh, mental disorders. So we'll cover, we'll try to cover as many as we can over here. Obviously, we can't cover them all because uh, the SM5 specifies uh, uh, more than 100 and we don't have the time to cover them all, but we'll cover the most important. So today we'll cover mood disorders. Now, in the previous class, we talked about psych, uh, schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. And although there are differences um, between each of those disorders, uh, the main characteristic in those disorders is uh, psychotic symptoms, either hallucinations, delusions, or something else. And it's basically a loss of touch with reality. Here in mood disorders, it's different. Here, people are not necessarily psychotic, although they may have psychotic symptoms. But the main characteristic has more to do with their, uh, with their mood, about whether they feel depressed. So in that case, the mood would be very low. Or if they are in a very excited mood, um, we could call them uh, in a maniac state. Um, so here, the patient is not uh, out of touch with reality. I mean, they still understand the world but they may have some distorted vision of reality and the psychotherapeutical treatment, uh, at least according to the cognitive behavioral approach, is to make the patient understand that their vision of the world is uh, distorted. This is especially the case when it comes to depression. Uh, now remember that uh, there is a particular disorder that's pretty much a combination of mood disorders and psychotic disorders, and that's uh, schizoaffective disorder. We already covered it in the previous class. And in that disorder, uh, the patient says, has symptoms of uh, psychosis. Uh, and also, they have symptoms of mood disorders, either bipolar disorder or depressive disorder. But you have, to under you have to learn how to make the difference because if the patient is either bipolar or has a major depressive disorder, in one of the mood episodes, either a manic episode or a depressive episode, they may have psychotic symptoms. But once that episode is over, or it's in remission, then the symptoms disappear. If that is the case, that would not be a schizoaffective disorder. In a schizoaffective disorder, the patient retains the psychotic symptoms even in the absence of uh, mood episodes, but they would still continue uh, with their mood disorder. So we'll cover some of the mood disorders today. So what are mood disorders? Well, they're disorders characterized by a primary disturbance in, in, in an internal emotional state. So the patient may feel either somewhat worse than would be expected, and we usually call that dysthymia, uh, very much worse than would be expected, that would be depression, somewhat better than would be expected, so that would be hypomania, and very much better than would be expected. Uh, we would categorize that as mania. Now keep in mind that these are not properly the DSM-5 criteria or, or the DSM-5 categorizations, but these are the initial categorizations so we make sense of the diversity of mood disorders. So these are the categories of mood disorder, properly speaking. There is major depressive disorder. There is a dys dysthymia, which is a less severe than depressive disorder. This is having depression, but not to the degree of major depressive disorder. Uh, there is a disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. We'll get to that shortly. There is a bipolar disorder. There are two types of bipolar disorder, one and two. We'll get to the differences shortly. And there is cyclothymia, which is, um, a, let's say, a milder form of the bipolar uh, disorder. So it's a less severe than bipolar disorder. Now, as for the epidemiology of these disorders, uh, well, there are really no major differences in socioeconomic groups in ethnicities or in nationalities. This is not the case with other uh, mental disorders that we'll get to in future lectures, but in mood disorders there really is no uh, major difference in these groups. Um, in the case of men, between 5 and 12 percent are afflicted uh, with major depressive disorder, whereas for women the prevalence is uh, 
much higher. It's uh, between 10 and 20 percent. So the, there is a 2 to 1 female to male ratio. So uh, women are twice as likely as men to uh, be diagnosed with uh, any of these disorders. Uh, for the bipolar disorder, I'm sorry, we're talking here about major depressive disorder. For the bipolar disorder, uh, the prevalence in the whole population uh, is 1% uh, overall, and there really is no sex difference. For uh, the dysthymia, it's 6% uh, overall, uh, and it's up to three times more common in women. And for cyclothymia, uh, it, it's, uh, the prevalence is less than 1% of the overall population, and again, there really is a um, sex difference. So let's go to the first uh, disorder that the DSM-5 specifies, and this is major depressive disorder. Now, very much as the name implies, well, this is a disorder when people feel depressed. Now, this doesn't mean that if you still feel sad one Sunday afternoon when it's raining, uh, you should already be diagnosed with a major depressive disorder. I mean, it's um, r normal for all of us to feel sad every once in a while, uh, especially given certain circumstances. Uh, however, uh, if the sad mood is persistent and it's severe and it impairs man, much of our functioning every day, then uh, we sh have reason to believe that uh, the patient uh, may have to be diagnosed with some uh, mood disorder and the DSM-5 and gives us some specifications about how to do that. So let's begin with major depressive disorder. Now the DSM-5 tells us that in order to diagnose uh, someone with this disorder, and the patient needs to have five or more of uh, the following symptoms and they have to be present for at least two weeks. So first of all, depressed mood. This is, you know, feeling sad. Uh, anhedonia. Anhedonia is uh, the inability to feel pleasure. So if the patient was uh, found pleasure in some activities in the past and they no, long, they no longer find pleasure in that or they find no pleasure in anything else, uh, that would qualify as anhedonia, uh, which is a diminished interest in any other activity or the inability to feel pleasure. So that's the second uh, symptom. Significant weight loss or weight gain. Now, it's uh, the, it, uh, whenever I have encountered patients that have been uh, diagnosed with a major depressive disorder, it's much more common that the, they lose weight. Uh, but there could also be a significant weight gain. So you should watch for those two. Uh, there are also sleep irregularities, so there is either insomnia, not being able to sleep, or hypersomnia, sleeping too much. Again, it's one of those two extremes. Um, uh, it, could go, it, it could go either way, so you have to watch for both extremes in order to make a diagnosis. Uh, there can be psychomotor retardation or agitation. It's far more common psychomotor retardation, and this means that people go very much as in slow motion. So you talk to the patient and they have a... They take a very long time to reply, and whenever they speak, they speak very slowly, and they have a very long reaction time. All of that is psychomotor retardation. Uh, fatigue, so feeling tired. Feelings of worthlessness, you know, this is not having good self-esteem, thinking that life has no meaning, and so on. Uh, diminished ability to concentrate, so not being able to carry on a task. And also uh, suicidal ideation. Well, this is the idea. Uh, this is playing with the idea that uh, they may kill themselves. And you know, just imagining what the world would be like when they are not there, and how they would kill, how they would kill themselves, well, what they will do with their body after they kill themselves, and so on. All of that is suicidal suicidal ideation. So, in order to be diagnosed with major depressive disorder, uh, the patient has to present five of these symptoms for at least two weeks. Now, also the symptoms must cause distress, as in almost every other mental disorder that we have talked about, and the symptoms cannot be due to substance abuse. Now, if you take some of, uh, if if a patient uh, abuses substances, uh, either cocaine or heroin or you know many of the uh, psychoactive drugs that we'll get to in another lecture, uh, these symptoms may come up. If those symptoms come up uh, in the midst of abusing drugs, then the patient should not be diagnosed with major depressive disorder. And also, uh, the patient should not be, the symptoms uh, should not be due to a significant loss, either a financial or a relative's death or an accident and so on. And the DSM-5 tells us that, well, because it's uh, normal for people uh, when they grieve or they have uh, 
or, or when they face very difficult situations to develop those symptoms. Well, what's really important here is how you overcome them. So just because you have for two weeks some symptoms due to a relative death, that's not enough to be diagnosed with a major depressive disorder. And also the symptoms must not be explained by other mood or psychotic disorders. Uh, and there should be no history of maniac or hypomaniac episode. This has to do basically with differential diagnosis. So if the symptoms come up as a result of other psychotic, di of other disorders, either psychotic or mood disorders, then they shouldn't be diagnosed with a major depressive disorder. So there should be also some uh, specifications when it comes to this disorder. Uh, the psychiatrist should specify whether or not the patient has a seasonal pattern. Now, a seasonal pattern uh, in tropical countries such as uh, Venezuela, my country, this is not common at all because we don't have winter season or fall season. But in more in areas or in countries where the climate is a template or uh, where there are seasons, uh, it's uh, there is a high risk of becoming depressed during the winter months. So these are called the winter blues. So uh, if you're going to diagnose a patient with major depressive disorder, it's important to specify whether or not uh, that depression comes from a seasonal pattern, whether or not they become more depressed as the winter approaches. And this is important to know because if you make that uh, a specification, then the treatment uh, would be different from a major depressive disorder without that specification. Because for the winter blues, well, the treatment could be an exposure to a full spectrum light and this is this has proven to be uh, quite successful in elevating the mood and treating um, uh, major depressive disorders so receiving light and being exposed to light uh, to a full spectrum light has some uh, encouraging uh, effects on the patients and you must also specify whether or not the patient has some uh, psychotic features now remember that these psychotic features if they only appear when the episode is the, the, the depressive episode is very intense then you should specify a major depressive disorder if the psychotic features continue even when there is no uh, depressive uh, episode then maybe you should think of diagnosing schizoaffective disorder now, in major depressive disorder and in many other mood disorders, you always have to be on watch for suicide risk. Let's make clear, first of all, that it is a myth that people who threaten with suicide don't carry it out. So there is this idea that whenever someone says, I'm going to kill myself, everybody says, oh, he's just playing, don't pay attention to him. Uh, he's just threatening, he just wants attention. That may be more the case with uh, patients with borderline personality disorder, which is different, very, di it's quite different from uh, patients with major depressive disorder. Perhaps in patients with a uh, borderline personality disorder, uh, you could believe more that uh, their suicide threats are more, uh, you know, histrionic than, than really intending to carry them out. Uh, but in the case of major depressive uh, disorder or other mood disorders, when there is a threat of a suicide, it should be taken uh, seriously uh, because it's, it is a myth that people who threaten with suicide don't carry it out. Uh, there is an increased risk in patients with major depressive disorder for suicide. And the risk factors are, well, first of all, serious uh, prior suicide attempts. So if someone in the past has already tried this, um, there is still the probability that they will try it again. If they are older than 45 years old, they are at a greater risk of uh, suicide attempt. If they are alcohol dependent, if they have a history of rage and violent behavior, if they are men, uh, and also some occupations are at a higher risk than other occupations when it comes to, a su to suicide. Usually those uh, occupations or professions that, uh, have a, that are much more stressful. So, for instance, you physicians are at a higher risk than we uh, liberal, arts, liberal arts professors of uh, killing yourselves because, of course, your profession is much more stressful than our profession. So, physicians, dentists, police officers, attorneys, the unemployed, all those uh, professions are at a higher risk of suicide risk. Uh, depending on the method that is chosen in order for to commit a suicide, there is either a higher rate or a lower rate of lethality when it comes to attempting to kill yourself. So um, you, people are more likely to be more successful when trying to kill themselves 
if they shoot themselves, if they hang themselves, or if they jump from some building. The lower rate of lethality is more related to taking pills or slashing one's uh, wrists. So that's a major depressive disorder. Let's consider now another uh, mood disorder that's uh, categorized in the DSM-5. And this is the persistent depressive disorder or, as it is uh, sometimes also known, uh, dysthymia. Although the real name here in the DSM-5 is persistent uh, depressive disorder. So let's consider what the DSM-5 what the DSM-5 has to say about this. Well, in order to diagnose it, you need to have a depressed mood for most of the day, most days for two years. And you need to have two or more of these symptoms. So keep in mind here that the persistent depressive disorder is a milder form when it comes to, compare, when it comes to being compared to a major depressive disorder. Uh, in major depressive disorder, you need at least five of those symptoms in order to be diagnosed. Uh, and he here, you only need uh, two or more of these symptoms, although uh, major depressive disorder may be more intense, but uh, the requirement for diagnosis in terms of time is shorter. Whereas here, although the symptoms may be less intense because you only require two of these symptoms, you need to have a depressed mood uh, for two years. So let's consider two or let's consider which are the symptoms that the patient needs to have and remember that he needs to have at least two of them in order to be diagnosed with this. Well, first of all, poor appetite. That's related also to weight loss as in the previous uh, disorder. Insomnia or hypersomnia, so not sleeping enough or sleeping too much. Fatigue, uh, feeling tired. Low self-esteem. This also has to do with uh, feelings of uh, not being worthy, of worthlessness poor concentration, and uh, feelings of hopelessness. So, you know, this is the idea that the world doesn't have meaning, that the world, uh, uh, the, the, there is nothing to do about it, the world, about, getting, about improving things in life because, you know, uh, it's really no use, there is no hope, and so on. DSM-5 also specifies that in order to make diagnosis, uh, of this uh, persistent depressive disorder, uh, the patient uh, ha must uh, have never been without symptoms A or B for more than two months. So in the previous symptoms, if there were more than two months then, and, this, and the patient did not show these symptoms during that period, then the patient should not be diagnosed with this disorder. Uh, there may be criteria of major depressive disorder and they may be present, but again, bear in mind, that the difference here is in the intensity. This is a milder form, although it lasts longer. Uh, there should not be manic or hypomanic episodes, and you may ask, well, why not? Well, because this is a differential diagnosis for another uh, disorder that we'll get to shortly, which is the bipolar uh, disorder, bipolar 1 and bipolar 2, and we'll see the difference. Uh, in bipolar 1 and bipolar 2 disorder, uh, there are manic and hypomanic episodes. So. If those episodes are present, then we shouldn't diagnose with uh, the patient with persistent depressive disorder. Uh, there, another differential diagnosis is also uh, schizoaffective or other psychotic disorder. So if there are psychotic symptoms here, then the patient should not be diagnosed with this. Uh, the symptoms should not be as a result of uh, substance abuse. And of course, uh, as in every other, men as in almost every other mental disorder, the symptoms must cause distress. So, so far, those are the disorders that have to do with a depressed mood. Now, before we get to the other disorders that also have to do with depressed mood, but are also alternated uh, with uh, not depressed mood, but with uh, mania, that is to say the opposite of being depressed, you know, very uh, euphoric. Uh, and in those disorders, there's an alternation between those two states. So that's why they're called bipolar disorder. Uh, before we get to that, we'll uh, introduce here a new disorder that is categorized by the DSM-5, and that is the Disruptive Mood Dysregulation Disorder. So let's take a look at uh, what uh, this disorder is, is about. Um, well, the DSM-5 tells us that in order for a patient to be diagnosed with this, first of all, they may have temper outbursts. So this is, uh, you know, the patient... Uh, may get very angry all of a sudden and they may have a trouble uh, controlling their anger 
and uh, they may have a temper, so to speak. You know, uh, of course, we're talking here in clinical terms, uh, but in lay terms, it will be those people that are very moody and have a, a very hot temper. Okay, uh, the temper outbursts are inconsistent with developmental level. Now, keep in mind, I mean, if you see a two-year-old child, well, it's very likely that the two-year-old child uh, will be crying for almost anything, and, you know, uh, the two-year-old child, and they're called terrible twos, and not for nothing. I mean, they're called like that because uh, they do have a short temper, and uh, they have terrible temper, and if they don't get it their way, then they begin to cry, or they begin to kick the floor, or they begin to grunt, and so on. Uh, now, should a two-year-old child be uh, diagnosed with a disruptive mood dysregulation disorder? Well, no, because uh, the DSM-5 is telling us that the temper outbursts uh, have to be inconsistent with the developmental level. And in a two-year-old child, if the two-year-old is angry and crying for just about anything, well, that's not inconsistent with the developmental level because that's basically what you expect out of a two-year-old child. So... Uh, in, as, uh, as a criterion B is telling us, uh, well, the temper outbursts uh, have to be inconsistent with the development level. Now, the outburst, uh, there should be uh, three or more times per week. So this has to be a recurrent thing in order to be diagnosed with this disorder. Uh, the mood between the outbursts um, is irritable. So these are people that, you know, they may have explosions of rage, but even in between those explosions, they still remain irritable. irritable. Um, the criteria, uh, the temper outbursts and the irritable mood uh, should be present for a year. And uh, this, mm, both the temper outbursts and uh, the, the irritable mood should be present in at least two settings, either at home or at school or somewhere else. So if the person, this, this disruptive mood, the regulation disorder is a... Uh, it's, it's more for uh, uh, teenagers and kids, right? Because uh, as we see here, uh, the criterion G is that the diagnosis must be between 6 and 18 years old. But this is why it must be kept in mind that uh, the outbursts are inconsistent with the developmental level. Uh, but this is quite common in teenage years. But it's important, and we go back here to criterion F, that the outbursts uh, happen in more than one setting. So if the kid is... Uh, uh, let's say a 14-year-old kid is uh, very angry all the time, but only at home. But at school, he behaves well, and he doesn't have this irritable mood. So he only gets upset at home, uh, but not at school. And he screams at his parents, but only at home and not at the teachers at school and so on. Then you shouldn't diagnose uh, uh, this patient with this disorder because he's only uh, uh, showing the irritable mood and the temper outbursts in one setting. And in order to diagnose it, uh, the patient has to uh, sh show these uh, symptoms in at least uh, two settings. So uh, the age of onset uh, must be uh, before 10 years old. So if this begins after 10 years old, then it shouldn't be diagnosed as such. Uh, the patient should never have had a, a maniac or hypomaniac episode. Uh, there should not have been any uh, major depressive disorder or another mental disorder. And the symptoms uh, should not be due to medication or substance abuse. If the patient gets these symptoms due to medication or substance abuse, then that's another mental disorder. It's not a disruptive mood, uh, mood dysregulation disorder. So disruptive mood dysregulation disorder is basically a disorder for kids. Uh, they have to be diagnosed prior to the age of 10, but the diagnosis may continue. Uh, all the way until they're 18 years old. So, you know, this is, uh, teenage, are, teenage years are quite difficult. And, you know, during those years, that uh, because of the reasons that we studied in uh, developmental psychology, uh, teenagers have to make a lot of adjustments. And if, in making those adjustments, they develop a very, uh, a very hot temper and irritable mood with all those symptoms, then, you know, uh, this is, psychiatrists may think of diagnosing the person with Disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Okay, so let's consider now the bipolar disorders. Now, these, these uh, disorders, uh, they used to be called manic depressive, and they used to be called like that because the patient would alternate, 
for some cycles, and these cycles will, would not be extremely short. I mean, this is not just a matter of hours or days. If it's a matter of just hours or days, then we, we should may, maybe we should be thinking about borderline personality disorder, uh, which is a, a, a very different disorder that we'll get to later on. Here, uh, the swings from one mood state to the other, uh, they're usually in cycles. So it could be a matter of weeks or even months. So in bipolar disorders, uh, the patients may be in a depressive mood for some cycle, let's say a few weeks, and then they may turn uh, very euphoric and they may enter into a maniac phase. Now, the difference between depression and maniac, uh, well, we'll get to that shortly, but depress, being depressed is being sad, not feeling, uh, not wanting to do anything, not finding pleasure in anything, uh, not having the spirit to do things to carry them out. In mania, it is the opposite. I mean, it's really being excited. It's wanting to do everything. It's not wanting to stop, no, not needing to rest. Uh, uh, depressive patients tend to sleep more than uh, not sleep. Uh, they, they tend to have more hypersomnia than insomnia. Uh, maniac patients, uh, they, they don't really have insomnia because they just don't want to go to sleep. And they feel that they're losing time if they go to sleep because they have so much stuff to do because they're very euphoric. So those are some of the characteristics of, the, uh, of, of what mania is like. So in bipolar disorders, uh, there are episodes of both mania and depression. Uh, in that case, it would be bipolar one disorder or both hypomania and depression. In that case, it would be bipolar 2 disorder. Uh, now, there is no mania without depression. So this is why uh, the DSM-5 doesn't uh, categorize manic disorder. Manic disorder does not exist. If you find a patient that is uh, showing signs of being a maniac, then that patient is uh, bipolar, either bipolar 1 or bipolar 2. And you can expect that sooner or later, that patient that's behaving like a maniac uh, will eventually have a depressed mood. So all that euphoria, all that feeling of you know being the king of the world, that will eventually crash. And usually the crash is very hard because you know they're on top of the world and all of a sudden they come way down. They will come all the way down to the bottom in terms of mood and they may stay there for quite a longer time than they stayed up there when they were in the maniac phase of, of the disorder. So just to gather an idea of what a maniac patient may be like, well, maybe uh, you remember Robin Williams, the famous actor, and he was uh, diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And whenever he performed in many of his uh, routines or, uh, or some of his roles in movies, he was always very active. You know, he was moving very fast and speaking very fast and making jokes all the time. And he had tremendous energy. And then all of a sudden we found out that he was not all that happy about it because eventually he killed himself. And that came as a shock because, you know, someone may wonder, well, well, how come someone that is so full of energy and so full of life all of a sudden decided to kill themselves? Well, again, it's because um, there is no mania without depression. Uh, and those people that uh, seem to be very euphoric, and they're really suffering because maybe at that specific specific time they seem to be okay and they seem to be having a great time uh, but if you see underneath you can see that uh, after that short period of mania they may be in, very, in a very depressed mood and the suicide risk is high and uh, Robin Williams who you know he was diagnosed and he understood that he lived with this condition he, he here is a quote for him he says do I perform sometimes in a maniac style yes Am I a maniac all the time? No, and of course not. No one can be a maniac all the time. Remember, all those patients that have manic episodes, they eventually also have depressive episodes. Do I get sad? Asks uh, Robin Williams. Oh, yeah. I mean, just what I'm showing you in the screen is just a... a, a uh, it's just the surface. I mean, I, the, the patient may really look uh, very excited, very, may look very happy, but deep inside they're very sad. Does it hit me hard? Oh yeah. So, you know, uh, some people may think that uh, being maniac is great, but no, this is something that's uh, really a matter of concern. Okay, so let's take a look at the what uh, the DSM-5 has to say about uh, bipolar disorder 1 and bipolar disorder 2. So let's look at the criteria. Well, first of all, the patient needs to have a manic episode. Uh, and a manic episode, uh, remember, it's, uh, well, at least one week of elevated mood. So, you know, 
Uh, how do you know what elevated mood is? Well, we take a look at the symptoms here, but remember, it's uh, more or less the opposite of depressive mode. So even if, if when you're depressed, you feel terrible. Uh, when you are in the maniac episode, you feel great. Uh, if when you are depressed, you speak very slowly. Uh, well, when you have a um, when you're in a manic episode, uh, you speak very fast and so on. So at least one week of elevated mood, and you need to have three or more of these symptoms. First of all, inflated self-esteem. So this is the idea that you can do just anything because you are the king of the world. Uh, there's nothing that can stop you. Uh, a decreased need for sleep. So you don't need to sleep because you think that you have to do so much stuff that if you sleep, you're losing time. That you don't need to. Uh, rest or take a break because uh, you know that's for weak people and you're very strong and you're great so you don't need to sleep uh, extremely talkative so whereas depressed people are not talkative at all because they're so depressed that they only you know they're they're much concerned with themselves and not with anything else here with maniacs uh, they really want to talk so you know they're extremely talkative and they usually they talk very fast so there may be a flood of ideas you know a lot of ideas may come to their mind now keep in mind this is a little bit disorder from a, a speech disorganization in psychotic disorders this is different and uh, flight of ideas i mean many ideas may come out of the patient but they still keep a coherence whereas in speech disorganization which is more common of uh, psychotic uh, people first of all they do not speak as fast they are not as talkative as maniacs and uh, they just don't make sense whereas in people with a maniac episode i mean they may talk a lot and it may be hard to follow them because of how fast they're going and because of how many ideas there are but they still keep a coherence so there may be a flight of ideas but this is different from a speech disorganization uh, another symptom distractibility so yes they are so excited that it's hard for them to concentrate on something particular so they are easily distracted by other things uh, an increase in goal-oriented activity so during many episodes uh, patients may achieve great things uh, if you have the project of writing a book well if you're in a manic episode you may write the book in just one night for instance uh, and some of the great artistic achievements uh, have been done by people suffering from the bipolar disorder and they managed to have a fine great uh, artistic creativity in the manic phase of bipolar disorder so there's an increase in goal-oriented activity so if you have a goal uh, well if you are in the uh, maniac phase uh, you are much more likely to achieve those goals because you you just don't stop you don't you don't have a need to to take a break or to rest so uh, if you propose to paint the house well you do it and you know in just one stretch and, and you don't stop until you finish it and you have the energy to keep going and going and going and this may all seem great, uh, but there are some important risks. Uh, another symptom here is risky activity. So if you have too much energy and you feel euphoric and so on, um, your judgment may be impaired. So you may engage in some risky activities such as uh, sexual promiscuity. So, uh, you know, you may just be sexually disinhibited and uh, going to bed with just whoever comes across you. Uh, there is a lot of uh, another risky activity that's very common in people with uh, the manic episodes is gambling, uh, uh, shopping, you know, going on people that go on shopping sprees and so on or gambling sprees. They're usually, not always, but they're usually suffering from bipolar disorder and they do this stuff when they're in their manic phase. And of course, in order to be diagnosed, all of this must cause some, uh, must cause social impairment. And the manic episode is not attributable to medication or substance abuse. So remember, bipolar disorder one is a manic episode for at least one week with three of those symptoms and also uh, the symptoms that we consider for the depressive mood disorders. Now, we, we already took a look at the manic episode. And if there is manic episode and also the presence of the, the depressed mood uh, also the presence of symptoms for depressed mood, then diagnosis there would be bipolar disorder one. Now for bipolar disorder two, it would be having the same symptoms of uh, depressed mood, but also a hypomaniac episode. Now a hypomaniac episode is pretty much like a maniac episode, but in a milder form. So it should be an elevated mood for at least uh, four days, whereas in the manic episode, it's for at least uh, one week. 
and uh, it should be uh, the same symptoms as in mania uh, that we already covered and uh, the symptoms, uh, the episode, the hypomanic episode must not be concordant with the individual's normal state. So if a patient uh, behaves in a given manner but all of a sudden it's not normal for them to have a very high elevated mood then that should uh, be considered another uh, criterion uh, to diagnose a hypomaniac episode. Uh, now the change in mood should also be observable by others and but uh, as in as in uh, different from a um, from mania the deepest the episode does not have to be severe enough to cause impairment so this is one of the disorders uh, one of the uh, mental disorders where uh, the criterion for uh, distress and, and impairment is not included so if a manic episode causes uh, distress well, that manic episode should be diagnosed as part of bipolar disorder 1. If it doesn't cause uh, impairment, then that should be diagnosed as a part of a bipolar disorder 2. And also, the hypomaniac episode should not be to drugs or medication. Uh, if you take cocaine, for instance, well, it's likely that you may have a either a hypomaniac or a maniac episode because cocaine, one of the effects of cocaine intoxication is uh, precisely you know, these feelings of euphoria and decreased need for sleep and goal-oriented activities and so on. Uh, if you have that episode as a result of taking cocaine, then you should not be diagnosed with a bipolar disorder, either one or two. So those are the uh, episodes of mania and hypomania. Okay, so let's turn now to cyclothamic disorder. Uh, the DSM criteria for this is that uh, there must be uh, depressive and hypomaniac symptoms but not really full episodes for at least two years. Now, in those two years, the individual has had symptoms at least half the time and has not had more than two months uh, without the symptoms. The symptoms should not be explained by psychotic disorders, uh, especially the schizoaffective uh, disorder, uh, as we already studied this, and the symptoms must not be due to drugs or to um, medication. Uh, Let's take a look at the etiology of mood disorders. I mean, what are the causes? Why would someone develop a, either a bipolar disorder or a depressive um, or major depressive disorder and so on? Well, first of all, there is a genetics. So for the general population, uh, the risk of getting a bipolar disorder or, or, or a mood disorder is 1%. Uh, but if you have a parent or a sibling or a, uh, with a, a mood disorder, uh, then your risk of uh, getting one of these disorders increases to 20%. Uh, if both of your parents are, have a, are bipolar, then your probability of having a mood disorder is 60%. And if you're, uh, if you're a monozygotic twin and your, your, your monozygotic twin uh, also has a, either a, a mood disorder, uh, then uh, the probability that you will develop bipolar disorder or other mood disorder is 75%. So this suggests that uh, mood disorders have a strong uh, genetic component. But there are also psychosocial factors. Uh, there may be some stressors that activate uh, depressive episodes in people. So maybe the loss of a parent in childhood, the loss of a spouse or a child in adulthood, uh, there is also the problem of low self-esteem and the negative interpretation of life events. So if you have a personality that tends to interpret things negatively, uh, you are at a higher risk of developing um, either bipolar disorder or uh, depressive disorders. There's also learned helplessness. If you remember from our uh, lecture on, uh, on learning theory, uh, you remember that there may come a time when people feel so so uh, they, they feel so affected by adverse consequences that eventually they come to learn to be helpless and that they come to think that there really is nothing that they can do about it so if do some difficult circumstance you eventually come to develop learn helplessness then you're at a, at a much higher risk of developing some mood disorder uh, now in the case of mania or hypomania uh, this has apparently more to do with the biological factors and non-psychosocial factors. So psychosocial factors account 
for uh, mood uh, for uh, depressive uh, episodes or depressive disorders but not for mania or hypomania and there are other factors that may cause uh, mood disorders uh, some drugs so uh, some uh, prescription drug use may eventually have as a side effect uh, uh, some mood disorders so for instance isotretinoin isotretinoin i'm sorry and this is used for acne or also uh, it may also be used uh, as cancer medication uh, some uh, beta blockers uh, some steroids uh, some uh, another medication for instance interferon which is used to treat uh, viral hepatitis and also oral contraceptive pills all of that may have as a side effect uh, uh, mood disorders uh, crack cocaine and amphetamines uh, also as a side effect they may also have uh, mood disorders as a result usually we'll cover this when we get to uh, substance abuse disorders in another lecture but for the time being it suffices to know that usually the effect of cocaine and, and amphetamines is euphoria uh, but only for a very short period of time uh, sometimes just for one hour so you know you have feelings of very intense feelings of uh, euphoria of feeling great uh, you may be very alert you may have no need to sleep you may have uh, uh, an, an increase in goal-oriented activity you may have a, a time to have enormous productivity but after that uh, after the effect is gone uh, then you may really hit the bottom and become very depressed so cocaine and amphetamines uh, uh, may uh, cause mood disorders. Now remember, the, if the symptoms are due to substance abuse, uh, they are not uh, really, they shouldn't be diagnosed as such. But if you increase, uh, if you increase uh, the abuse in the long term, that may actually uh, increase the risk of uh, developing mood disorders. Also, uh, for women, uh, the menopause, um, that may also increase the risk of getting uh, mood disorders. Uh, nutritional deficiencies so not being well fed that may also increase the risk for mood disorders and if you remember when we talked about the uh, pregnancy um, there is always a risk for a mother that just gave birth recently to develop the baby blues uh, this is postpartum depression so in those uh, cases there are also uh, risks that the patient may develop uh, mood disorders so there are some factors uh, that uh, may also influence the prognosis and we may consider them also as course modifier so in bipolar disorders rapid cycling indicates poor diagnosis so if the patient has a very short cycle of mania and then a short cycle of depression and then going back to a short cycle of mania and, and again to depression well rapid cycling in, indicates poor diagnosis so it's harder to treat if uh, the mood uh, changes are are faster uh, factors that are associated with good prognosis is well first of all good education so the more education you have the better chances are that you may be uh, that you may that you have a better prognosis and as we have mentioned in other mental disorders being married is a good predictor of uh, good health so if you're married and you have the support of a spouse or relatives then that it, uh, increases your chances of making some recovery and that uh, improves your uh, prognosis. Uh, for major depressive disorder, uh, neuroticism, this is a personality trait which is a negative affectivity. So this is, you know, looking at things in a bad light, you know, and not being optimist about the world. Well, if, you, if that's your personality, then that increases your risk of getting major depressive disorder and that... Uh, is not a good uh, sign for a prognosis for a good prognosis now remember when you diagnose any of these disorders you have to make sure that you don't get them confused with other disorders and this is what in the dsm-5 is called differential diagnosis so maybe in the course of some of these disorders you may get some of the symptoms so for instance in schizophrenia there may be mood alterations in the schizoaffective disorder we've already talked about this in anxiety disorders in somatic symptom disorders anxiety disorders is when people have a, a lot of stress and they may fear something in somatic symptom disorders uh, this is when people have some stress but uh, uh, the symptoms uh, are not merely in their behavior but also they may have uh, some expression in, in in their own bodies um, 
eating disorders, drug and alcohol abuse, and in borderline personality disorders, in all those disorders, there may be symptoms that resemble mood disorders. Now you have to be, you have to, in order to make a good diagnosis, you have to make sure that those symptoms that you're collecting in order to make a diagnosis, that they are not as a result of all these, uh, uh, of all these mental disorders. If they are a result of these mental disorders, then you should not diagnose with the, the patient with any of the mood disorders, but rather with some of the disorders that are listed here. So what can be do about what can be done about mood disorders? What's the treatment? Well, unfortunately, uh, mood disorders and especially depression, uh, uh, especially major depressive disorder, uh, they are untreated conditions uh, because there is always the cultural stigma and the media stereotype that depressed people are weak, so that prevents patients from seeking attention. So it's important to let uh, people know that if they feel depressed. Well, help is out there, and, and, and they can get help. So, unfortunately, only about 25 of patients with depression seek and receive treatment. Uh, when it comes to treatment, well, the pharmacological treatment is the most effective. And what's the pharmacological treatment for uh, mood disorder? Well, for depression and dysthymia, uh, first of all, there are SSRIs, and this is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Now, um, if you have studied a little bit of neuroscience, uh, you know that in the synapses, um, when the presynaptic neuron sends uh, neurotransmitters to the other neuron, uh, and the other neuron absorbs uh, the neurotransmitter, uh, there is always uh, some uh, neurotransmitter left in the synapses, and the original neuron that sent the neurotransmitter reuptakes it. Uh, now, what the reuptake inhibitors do is that they prevent the sending neuron from doing this, so eventually there is more uh, of the neurotransmitter available for the other neuron to take. So by blocking the reuptake of uh, serotonin, uh, which is an important uh, neurotransmitter that's uh, related to mood, well, by blocking the reuptake of this uh, neurotransmitter, what the SSRI, SSRIs do is that they increase the availability of uh, serotonin in the synapse, and thus they improve mood. Uh, apart from SSRIs, probably the most famous one is Prozac or Fluoxetine. Apart from that, uh, there are also selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors or SNRIs. And uh, well, these are effective because uh, norepinephrine is another uh, neurotransmitter that is also associated with mood. So by, by blocking or inhibiting uh, the reuptake of this, uh, a neurotransmitter that allows for the uh, postsynaptic uh, neuron to receive more uh, of this neurotransmitter and that improves uh, mood. So these are for uh, basically uh, depression and dysphymia. However, as with any medication, you have to uh, beware of the side effects of both SSRIs and SNRIs. So the side effects for SSRIs are, uh, first of all, insomnia, not being able to sleep, uh, blurred vision, dry mouth, uh, nausea, uh, reduced libido, that is to say not enough sexual interest or sexual energy, and sexual uh, dysfunction. There could be a mild suicide risk in adolescents who take this medication. Uh, in the case of uh, SNRIs, uh, I'm sorry, also for SSRIs, uh, there is a risk of serotonin syndrome, and this is that if you let uh, too much uh, serotonin go from one neuron to the other, uh, that may increase, that may cause an excess of uh, serotonin, and that excess of serotonin may cause confusion, tremor, which is you know shaking, uh, rapid heart rate, so that could be risky, uh, high fevers and seizures. So you must uh, watch for all of this if you uh, prescribe uh, SSRIs as medication for uh, depression. In the case of SNRIs, uh, the side effects are nausea, dry mouth, uh, dizziness, headaches, excessive sweating, uh, tiredness, being tired, fatigue, insomnia, not being able to sleep, loss of appetite, and sexual dysfunction. Uh, there are some other pharmacological treatment for depression disorders, but they're not as favored uh, by psychiatrists, but let's mention here them nevertheless. There are three cyclic uh, treatments or three cyclic medication, and they're called three cyclic because uh, the composition of this is that they're made up of uh, three rings of atoms. 
so these are antidepressants and what they do is basically they also block or, or inhibit the reuptake of uh, serotonin and norepinephrine uh, and there are uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors or MAOIs and what they do is that they block uh, the monoamine oxidase and what monoamine oxidase does is that it breaks down the uh, neurotransmitters uh, both uh, serotonin and uh, norepinephrine so by uh, blocking uh, the monoamine oxidase um, what the, the monoamine oxidase inhibitors do is that well they allow for a better flow of serotonin and nor norepinephrine in neurotransmission and both of those neurotransmitters uh, play an important role when it comes to mood now also you should watch for some side effects here so for the case of uh, uh, tricyclic antidepressants uh, dry mouth, blurred vision, sweating, uh, racing heartbeat, increased sweating, and also urinary retention. So you might want to watch for that. And in the case of MAOIs, uh, there may be some involuntary muscle jerks. Uh, there may be low blood pressure, uh, reduced uh, libido, or there may be some difficulty reaching orgasm, and there may be weight gain. Also, MAOIs may cause an, a hypertensive crisis, so this is high blood pressure, if they are combined with foods in, that are high in tyramine, such as a wine or aged cheese. So, uh, both of these products uh, that are high in tyramine, either wine or aged cheese, are contraindicated if the patient is taking um, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Uh, here is a chart uh, with the antidepressant medication. So here are the, uh, the generic names and the brand names for some of the SSRIs. You see there are Prozac, which is the most famous one, but it's actually a fluoxetine, the generic name. There are the SNRIs uh, and the tricyclic and the MAOIs. So, you know, those are the names. Uh, let's talk now about that. all of those uh, medications are for uh, depressive uh, disorders. Let's talk now about bipolar disorders. What's the pharmacological treatment here? Remember that bipolar disorder, uh, it's a, an alteration between maniac and depressive episodes. Um, the pharmacological treatment here, it's uh, different. Here we're using uh, mood st stabilizers, and the most famous one is lithium. Now, in the case of lithium, the mechanism is not well understood. Uh, the hypothesis is, is that it, it might enhance a serotonergic uh, transmission. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, the mechanism is not as well as understood as it is in SSRIs. I mean, in, those, in the case of those medications, uh, the mechanism is much better understood. Um, they are quite effective in treating manic episodes, uh, but again, as in uh, the other pharmacological treatments, there are side effects and you, sh you have to watch them. So the side effects of lithium that's used for bipolar disorder are tremor, uh, that is to say shaking, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, so you know, symptoms of uh, disruption in the digestive system, and uh, weight gain. Other pharmacological treatment for bipolar disorder, it's also uh, anticonvulsant. They may be good in order to treat uh, mania. Uh, so some of the side effects here, uh, you have to watch for them. They may also be nausea, tremor, dizziness, weight gain, and uh, fatigue. Now, apart from pharmacological treatment, uh, there are other treatments. So for depression and dysthymia, uh, well, mm, Psychotherapists may recommend psychoanalytic uh, therapy, interpersonal, family, uh, behavioral, and cognitive therapy. Now, cognitive therapy is uh, quite important when treating uh, depression. And the founder of cognitive behavioral therapy, his name was Aaron Beck, uh, he devised uh, that uh, line of treatment specially to try or to treat uh, depressed patients. So basically what cognitive therapy is about, and you may remember when we studied this, is about recognizing the negative thoughts or behaviors uh, that distort one's vision of the world and that it may eventually lead people to have uh, some depressed mood. And what's usually done in this therapy is uh, recognizing the behaviors and then trying to change them in a most effective manner. Uh, now, it has been found a, the psychological treatment, especially if it's a cognitive uh, behavioral therapy, 
Uh, when it is used in conjunction with medication, uh, it is much more uh, effective than either type of treatment alone. So this is why psychiatrists recommend uh, using medication, but also they recommend psychotherapy, especially if it is based on uh, the cognitive behavioral approach. And you may remember uh, some of the distortions that uh, patients usually have uh, when they are, you know, they have a distorted vision of the world and the way cognitive behavioral therapy tries to correct them. Well, that's very common when it comes to depression. So here the task of psychotherapy in the cases of depression is trying confronting the patient and making the patient understand that uh, their negativity about the world may not be founded and that the, they eventually may uh, succeed in driving those thoughts away, those depressive thoughts away, if they come to realize that their uh, depression, that their um, that their way of understanding the world is not really accurate, that the world is not as bad as they say it is. Now, if uh, especially in the case of depressive di disorders, uh, they get to be very severe then um, maybe a more uh, extreme line of treatment could be uh, electroconvulsive therapy. Uh, now remember that this has been criticized by some psychiatrists, but unlike uh, lobotomy, uh, electroconvulsive ther therapy uh, is still defended by the mainstream. Uh, so in more severe cases, you know, this could be an option. However, you have to keep in mind that in order to apply this treatment, there, has, there, there need to be some conditions. Now, first of all, uh, the symptoms must not respond to antidepressant medications. Okay, so you only use this therapy in case that the medication doesn't work. Uh, uh, you should also keep in mind uh, that you should use uh, electroconvulsive therapy if the antidepressants are either too, gen too dangerous or have intolerable side effects. So keep in mind that antidepressant medication uh, is not a free ticket. It does have some serious side effects. If the side effects are are uh, too great and uh, too dangerous, then you may consider uh, electroconvulsive therapy as an alternative. And you should also use electroconvulsive therapy if uh, you need a rapid so uh, resolution of the symptoms. So, it's, for instance, if you have a patient that is depressed and uh, he's uh, threatening with uh, killing himself, and you have strong reason to believe that he may carry it out, and remember, you should always take this seriously, then uh, pharmacological or psychotherapeutical treatment will not uh, work because uh, those take a much longer time uh, to work, and you need a rapid resolution of these symptoms because there is a great risk that the patient may kill himself. So in that case, you should use uh, electroconvulsive therapy. Now, keep in mind that very much as in... Um, pharmacological treatment in electroconvulsive therapy. There are also side effects and you should consider them. Uh, there is memory loss, uh, there is a, and there is also the risk of mortality. Uh, but the risk of mortality is not properly as a result of uh, electroconvulsive therapy, but rather as a result of the, it may be as a result of the general anesthesia that is used in order to apply electroconvulsive therapy. Remember that unlike the past, uh, right now electroconvulsive therapy is prescribed under general anesthesia. In the past, uh, patients were usually not under anesthesia and that's why it was severely criticized. Today, uh, that line of criticism is no longer there because psychiatrists have come to understand that in order to uh, perform electroconvulsive therapy, uh, the patient should be under anesthesia. And also remember the ethics of uh, informed consent. So in these cases, unless the patient is really psychotic or he is a threat to himself and he's in really an, an extreme danger of killing himself, unless those conditions are there, the patient has to consent to receiving this treatment. Okay, so that wraps up our lecture. Let's do a couple of USMLE questions as review of what we discussed today. So a 20-year-old man comes in complaining of headaches and a variety of aches and pains, which have been present for the past six months. He denies that he is sad or hopeless. After a four-week trial of antidepressant medication, the patient's physical complaints have disappeared. So the, this patient was probably A, suffering from uh, hypochondriasis, uh, B, from this thymic disorder, C, from uh, cyclothymic disorder, D from mask depression, or E he was faking his symptoms for attention. Uh, 
well, I would say the right answer here is D, mass depression. Just because a patient says that he doesn't feel bad and that he doesn't feel sad or hopeless, that doesn't mean that you should take his word for it. I mean, a good diagnosis and a good uh, psychiatric interview is not just what the patient says, but also the way the patient behaves. And you have to be uh, suspicious enough in order to understand that maybe what a patient says is not what uh, really is going on. Uh, so uh, here it's, if after applying antidepressant medication, the symptoms went away, then it's quite likely that he was suffering from a depression, that he failed to acknowledge that he had it, but that he, he didn't hit, indeed have it. So it would be uh, mass uh, depression. Let's cover another question. A 25-year-old male patient who is uh, slow moving and has a flat effect uh, is put on fluoxetine or Prozac. Remember that this is a, a variant of SSRI or uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Within the two weeks, the patient is showing greatly increased activity level, flight of ideas, and pressure speech. In this patient, the medication has A, precipitated a manic episode, B, has had a toxic, toxic effect, C, had a delayed effect, D, increased anxiety, or E, increased depression. Well, it looks like here the right answer is a, a. The medication has precipitated a manic episode. Uh, the patient has symptoms of depression uh, because he has a slow motion and flat effect, so he doesn't really respond uh, to things that are going out there because, you know, he's, he seems to be in a very low mood. And he's provided with an SSRI. But remember that uh, by blocking uh, the reuptake or inhibiting the reuptake of a select or the selective reuptake of a serotonin, uh, that may actually uh, take the patient to the other extreme of uh, of mood. So um, if from going to be from being very depressed to being uh, to now having an, a very increased activity level and having flight of ideas and speaking too fast and having a lot of ideas. Uh, when they speak, then uh, that has precipitated a manic episode.